Good afternoon. I'm uh, Bob Bennett, uh, the Dean at Northwestern. It's uh, my very great pleasure to welcome you to this Federalist Society Symposium on Originalism, Democracy, and the Constitution. I express that pleasure not only in my official capacity as Dean uh, of the school that's pleased to act as uh, host for this gathering, but also personally. The subject of the conference is one that has long intrigued me, and I will be turning an attentive ear as much as I can to panels discussing originalism from various angles of vision over the next day and a half. And a wonderful series of panels it is. I have long been an admirer of the academic integrity that characterizes Federalist Society's symposia, and this one is no exception. There is no setup here for those who think that the project of originalism must immediately appeal to all persons of goodwill who earnestly apply themselves to thinking through the issues of democracy and constitutionalism and judicial review, uh, nor uh, for those who think the opposite. Indeed, the organizers of this gathering have done such a splendid job on all fronts that this promises to provide a set of debates and discussions that will be classics in the ongoing puzzlement about our constitutional order. Let me now turn the platform over to a young man who, in addition recently to getting engaged to be married, uh, my wife might say that even Ray Charles could have seen that coming, is rapidly becoming as important to, Northwestern, to the Northwestern Law School community as he has long been to the Federalist Society. The man, uh, some suspect, is James Madison, plunked down in the late 20th century America, Steve Calabresi. Thank you, Dean Bennett. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the 14th Annual National Student Symposium of the Federalist Society. On behalf of Gary Lawson and the entire Northwestern chapter of the Federalist Society, let me say that it's a great honor to have so many distinguished guest speakers and students from other law schools here uh, for this weekend's conference. The topic for the conference, of course, is uh, originalism, democracy, and the Constitution. Our goal over the next two days is to explore many of the core issues of constitutional theory and interpretation, and we hope in doing this to contribute to the great debate over the proper role of judges in invalidating the actions of the majoritarian branches of government in our system of constitutional democracy. We decided to revisit the originalism debate at this year's Northwestern Conference for essentially four reasons. First, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the swearing in of our trustee, Edwin Meese III, to be the 75th Attorney General of the United States. During his time in office, Mr. Meese rapidly became one of the most influential and important attorneys general in American history, both because of his role in guiding the historic presidency of Ronald Reagan and because of his role in reforming and transforming the American legal system. One of Mr. Meese's earliest acts in office 10 years ago was to publicize the originalism debate, which had previously gone on rel relatively unnoticed in the legal academy. It thus seemed fitting to us to revisit that debate 10 years later to weigh and evaluate the many arguments that have been made since. Second, this year also marks the fifth anniversary of the publication of Judge Robert Bork's national bestseller, The Tempting of America. Judge Bork is also a Federalist Society trustee, and his book is surely one of the most controversial bestsellers in American legal history. Given the evident gap between the popular and the academic reactions to the book, it seemed appropriate to us uh, to revisit the issues raised by the book and to discuss the merits of many and arguments made in many of the reviews. Third, originalism seemed an especially appropriate topic this year to all of us at Northwestern because of the recent publication of two books on the originalism debate by our colleagues Michael Perry and Stephen Presser. Michael Perry's new book, The Constitution and the Courts, Law or Politics, inspired and challenged all of us with its thoughtful analysis of and response to the many arguments made in the originalism debate. 
We are deeply indebted to Professor Perry for his help in organizing this symposium, and we wish to note that a number of our panel topics are deliberately modeled on the organization of and chapter headings uh, of his recent book. Professor uh, Stephen Presser's new book, Recapturing the Constitution, Race, Religion, and Abortion Reconsidered, makes a powerful originalist case against much of the modern work product of the US Supreme Court. Whereas Professor Perry thinks that that work product can be defended on originalist grounds, Professor Presser finds it deficient. Professors Presser's and Perry's differing originalist arguments should prove highly enlightening to the discussion of the originalist debate this weekend. Fourth and finally, holding a conference on originalism seemed vital to all of us here at Northwestern because we are proud to be the home of the original originalist, Raoul Berger, of the Northwestern class of 1935. Raoul Berger's critiques of judicial activism in government by judiciary and in countless law review articles over the years helped to give rise to the public originalism debate, and it thus seemed fitting that a conference on originalism should be held at his alma mater. I'd like now to say a couple of words about the structure of our panel discussions. The seven panels that follow all seek to address some of the most common criticisms that are made of originalism. They proceed in general from the abstract and, and philosophical to the more particular and concrete. We begin this afternoon with two panels that address the underlying questions of the desirability and legitimacy of constitutional government. Our first panel takes up the question debated long ago by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison over whether and why one generation ought to be able to bind its successors. In other words, why is it ever legitimate for the dead to rule the living? Originalism, like all other constitutionalist theories, assumes that the dead ought in some circumstances to be able to bind the living. We hope the first panel will explore whether that is so, and if so, why the dead should be so empowered. The second panel then considers the normative case for and against constitutional government. Why is it that we think a polity ought to have a constitution? Do the reasons which lead us to embrace constitutionalism generally also lead us to prefer written over unwritten custom-based constitutions? If they do, when and to what degree ought we to embrace originalism and constitutional interpretation? We hope the second panel will shed light on the normative case for constitutionalism and for at least some measure of originalism in constitutional interpretation. The third panel addresses the question, what is originalism? Many different religions now march under the originalist banner, as Professor Perry has noted, and we thus think it is essential to define originalism before we can proceed to analyze its merits and feasibility. This discussion will undoubtedly include some spirited defenses of originalism as well as criticisms of the theory. Panels four and five address the problem of two kinds of indeterminacy, normative and historical, both of which have been said to make originalism impossible in practice. Here, our intellectual debt to Michael Perry in structuring this conference is particularly strong. Both panels four and five will consider the implications for the judicial role of normative and historical indeterminacy. We hope these panels will help to shed light on the important question raised by Professor Perry of whether or not there is any relationship at all between originalism and more Thayerian notions of judicial restraint. Panel six takes up the vital question of the original meaning of the unusually open-ended language of the 14th Amendment. Originalism in American constitutional law would be far less useful as an approach to constitutional decision-making if it could not provide some plausible account of the meaning and significance of the vitally important language of section one of the 14th Amendment. Happily, we think this panel will show that the question of the original meaning of the 14th Amendment is not as difficult to solve as many have hitherto believed. Lastly, the participants on panel seven will address the viability of some of the leading alternatives to originalism in constitutional decision making. Some of these alternatives, such as a reliance on precedent and on common law constitutionalism, have gained support in recent years among a number of Supreme Court justices. We hope that panel seven will debate the merits and demerits of these alternative theories in a thorough and thoughtful fashion. Hopefully this discussion will serve as a useful conclusion to our two days of deliberation on the great originalism debate. Once again, we thank all of you for coming and we hope you'll enjoy the program ahead. And rather than pause, I think I would now like to invite the first panel to come up and begin its proceedings. Thanks very much. <laughs>